just three days after John Kennedy was killed. Just one day after Lee Harvey Oswald was killed. Then Deputy Attorney General Nicholas Katzenbach wrote this memo. The public must be satisfied that Oswald was the assassin, that he did not have Confederates at large, that the evidence was such that he would have been convicted at trial. They've never investigated this case, never had any desire to. The whole thing was a sham. The Warren Commission said, yes, Oswald was the lone gunman. I've been satisfied with the Warren Commission report. We always have, continue to be. The fact is that well more than 80% of the American public, even today, continue to reject the conclusions of the Warren Commission report. Do not accept the Warren Commission's findings that Lee Harvey Oswald was a sole gunman. In its simplest terms, what happened in Dealey Plaza is a 25-year-old homicide. But there is nothing simple about the assassination of a president of the United States. Arthur Schlesinger called the killing of JFK a quagmire for historians. It seems certain that a quarter century later there are more questions than answers. Tonight, a look at some of the questions in what for most Americans is an unsolved murder. KRON reports JFK, an unsolved murder. Special truck that has been moved up to the rear of the presidential jet. Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland, 6 p.m., November 22, 1963. The body of John F. Kennedy is returned to Washington from Dallas. But there is evidence that in this scene, so much a part of America's memory, all is not as it appears. The casket is dark brown in color. It looks as if it's bronze. My opinion would be that the casket was empty, the one that we saw on national TV. Dennis David is now a real estate executive in the Midwest. In 1963, David was senior enlisted man on duty at Bethesda Naval Hospital, where the president's body would be taken for an autopsy. All I know is that at some time, that body was taken out of that bronze casket. Could that really have happened? It's certain the president's body was in this casket when it was loaded onto Air Force One in Dallas. But several witnesses involved in the official proceedings say the president's body was in a totally different coffin when it arrived here at Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland. In trying to understand this, let's start back in Dallas, Parkland Hospital, just after 1 p.m. The President of the United States is dead. President Kennedy has been assassinated. It's official now. The President is dead. Aubrey Reich, now a police sergeant, was an ambulance attendant in November 1963. Who put the the president's body into the coffin? Uh, Dennis McGuire and myself lifted him and placed him in the casket. Paul O'Connor, now a retired police officer, then a Navy medical technician. He met the coffin several hours later at the Bethesda morgue. The door came open, in came the casket. I sat right next to the, the uh, autopsy table. We opened up the casket, and you know, I was right there, and I just helped lift the front part of his uh, you know, body up and put it on the table. Tell me about this casket it was a uh, bronze uh, self-sealing casket yeah, it was either gray on pink or pink on gray casket it was a very expensive casket just a plain casket is that what they call a shipping casket I've heard that well uh, yeah uh, it's, it wasn't a big ceremonial casket Dennis David was also there when the coffin carrying JFK arrived at Bethesda Hospital. This casket that you were carrying... It was a gray... I didn't carry it, but the men I took down carried it. It was just a gray casket. Gray metal... a metal shipping casket. Nothing ornate, nothing... It definitely wasn't the fancy casket that they showed on TV, which I saw later on. You mean Some it wasn't this casket? This is the one that... He was loaded onto the plane. No, ma'am, it wasn't that casket. It was just a plain gray shipping casket. You sure? I'm positive. Did it surprise you later to see the photographs of this big bronze casket? Yes. I, I, of course, you got to understand, I didn't see that picture until years later. I'm going, I said to myself, wait a minute. That's not the one that came in the, the morgue that night. This wasn't the one. 
if the caskets carrying the president were different, there are also opposing versions of how JFK's body was wrapped. And we knew that the blood was going to get into the casket, so we took a sheet, a rubber sheet, plastic sheet, you know, like they use for bedwetting type situations, and we lined the casket with this sheet. When you opened the casket, did you see his body immediately? No, he's in a body bag. A body bag? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like a crash bag. You mean like something like this? Is this the sort of thing you're talking about? Well, uh, just about it's the same color, matter of fact, as I can remember. Now, Mr. O'Connor says that the president's body was in a body bag like this. Did he leave Dallas in a body bag? He didn't leave Parkland Hospital in a body bag. And that's the last time I touched the president. I, we, we wouldn't use, I would hope we wouldn't use, you know, a crash bag to put the president's body in. I, I would hope it wouldn't come down to that. Uh, well, did you? No. No way. We lined the casket with a rubber sheet. I knew a body bag from the bed liner. I'm not sure it was a, it was a body bag. This gray Navy ambulance carried the coffin that was supposed to contain the president's body. But, says Dennis David, this was not the ambulance he met. It was a black ambulance, or a, some people would call a hearse, but it was a black, like a hearse, an ambulance. And Dennis David says the black ambulance with JFK's body got to the morgue well before Jackie Kennedy, the official motorcade, and the bronze coffin. I watched the motorcade come up, miss it, and then, of course, it, you know, I could see it come through the windows, and then I saw it pull up out front. You could look down through when she came in. Uh, I didn't think anything about it at the moment, but later on, when uh, they were talking about that she was escorting the body, uh, that's kind of funny because, you know, the body was already back in the morgue before when she pulled up there. I don't know how it got from Dallas to Naval Medical Center, but it, it got there before, before Mrs. Kennedy did, a good 15, 20 minutes before. Gerald Custer's job that night was to take x-rays of JFK's body. He says he had already taken a set of x-rays by the time Jackie Kennedy arrived. I was in the morgue, took a set of films, went up to the main entrance. Who was coming through the main entrance? But Jacqueline Kennedy. And I found out later that was supposedly she had come in with the president's body. So how could that be the president's body when I, the president's body was already in the morgue half an hour? If JFK's body did leave Dallas in one coffin and arrive at Bethesda Hospital morgue in another coffin, what was going on? The answer is we don't know. The explanations being offered are every bit as bizarre as the tale of the two coffins. For example, author David Lifton, whom we hired as a consultant for this report, he was the first to reveal the story of the two coffins and believes JFK's body was hijacked and surgically altered to hide evidence that more than one gunman fired at the president. The body did not make an uninterrupted journey between Dallas and Bethesda. That means there was an opportunity to alter the body. Lifton believes that while Jackie Kennedy was watching Lyndon Johnson being sworn as president in the midsection of Air Force One, JFK's body could have been removed from the bronze coffin in another part of the plane and hidden in the luggage compartment. Then, says Lifton, after Air Force One landed at Andrews Air Force Base, and while the nation watched the empty coffin being unloaded, the president's body was quietly taken off the plane through a rear entrance. But was it a plot or a security measure designed to protect the president's body? I interviewed General Chester Clifton in the summer of 1980. Clifton, who was military aide to the president and who made the arrangements by radio for the autopsy, said there was no security measures no decoy ambulance was used or anything of the sort that he knew of nothing of the sort he would have to know if there was a security measure he would be the person who would actually be implementing such a measure he denies it wasn't there somebody with a coffin at all times the coffin was always in the custody of a group of secret service agents and a navy rear admiral so if anything happened between dallas and bethesda and if the body was taken out of one coffin and put somewhere else on the plane or put into another coffin or into a body bag the presumption is that it didn't happen by magic and knowledge of that has to be known by some of those agents and or that navy admiral 
Are you accusing them of being involved in a conspiracy? No, I'm not, because I don't know who exactly has the knowledge. The Secret Service agents involved have stated they maintain constant vigilance over JFK's body through the entire trip, and the body could not have been removed from the bronze coffin. But the witnesses, men who were close to JFK's body that night in Dallas and Bethesda, are certain about what they saw. Your memory is real clear. It's clear enough to know that I did not participate in putting the president's body in a body bag. Do you think that it's possible after 25 years that you could be mistaken? No. No. I can't tell you what I did the next day or the day before, but that particular day, uh, I don't know, you know, it isn't every day you get an assassinated president come in, I guess. But uh, no, I, I, I have no qualms about my memory in that. I'm positive that that's what it was. As with so many questions in the assassination, we may never know why there were two coffins for JFK. That's partly because for years, key witnesses, many of them Navy men, were under orders to remain silent. Well, they called us into uh, the commanding officer's office. And when I say they, I'm talking about the autopsy team, the people that worked either directly or indirectly with it. And had us sign orders stating that we wouldn't talk under penalty of general court martial. And I can't remember the, the exact text of the uh, order. But what they said is, keep your mouth shut. And that I did. Some witnesses were simply afraid. We were, we were scared, let's face it. There was a lot of us that were afraid because we also you know, read about other individuals involved with uh, the Kennedy in one way or another who died mysterious deaths or were assassinated or died mysteriously. Do you still think you might be taking a risk? Yes. Why do you do it? Because my family's grown. And I've gotten older, and I don't know that uh, I've been through Vietnam, and I don't know that it, it doesn't scare me anymore. Uh, basically, uh, what I'm saying is, if you want to do something about it, here I am, to hell with you. Because I'm not afraid anymore. I think it's a damn shame that uh, there isn't more information released on it, and that the public has never gotten the full story. I wish it would come out before I die. I'd like to know exactly what happened to him. 25 years later, exactly what happened is still in dispute. Next, the controversy over a magic bullet. Dure of an argument as old as the assassination itself. An argument over whether more than one person fired at JFK. In the government version, it was one of the bullets that hit the president during the last six seconds of his life. The Warren Commission said Lee Harvey Oswald was the only shooter. That he used this rifle to fire three times from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository, killing the president and wounding then Texas Governor John Connolly. David Bellin was a counsel to the Warren Commission. The bullet that struck President Kennedy, which partially disintegrated two portions of that bullet, were ballistically identifiable and were shown to have come from Oswald's rifle to the exclusion of all of the weapons in the world. And that rifle was found on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository building, where the cartridge cases were also found by the assassination window, the three cartridge cases, which ballistically came from Oswald's rifle. But there was a problem. FBI sharpshooters test fired Oswald's rifle, a Mannlicher Carcano like this one. They established it took at least 2.3 seconds between shots. Time to shoot, work the bolt, and shoot again. And that doesn't allow time to aim. Film of the assassination taken by Abraham Zapruder shows that there was too short an interval between the hits on Kennedy and Connolly. 1.6 seconds. Oswald could not have fired his rifle that quickly. Since they were wounded in less time than it took to fire the rifle twice, um, there had to be a second gun firing to account for that, those two men being wounded in such a short period of time, unless one bullet went through both victims. Which brings us back to the bullet in question. The Warren Commission and the House Assassination Committee said it had, in fact, passed through both Kennedy and Connolly. It's known as the single bullet theory. Well, the single bullet theory is sheer, absolute, unadulterated nonsense. Cyril Wecht, coroner of Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, says the single bullet could not possibly have done the following. You had the bullet coming out of John Kennedy, moving then downward and to the left, 
and yet it slams into John Connolly behind the right armpit. Well, Connolly was sitting directly in front of Kennedy. So you've got to have the bullet coming out of Kennedy, stopping abruptly in midair, turning to the right, coming back about 20 inches, stopping again, turning around now to the left, and going into Connolly. And then after it goes into Connolly, it now moves at a downward angle of 45 degrees, whereas in Kennedy, it had a downward angle of 7 degrees. So that's the single bullet theory. It is better than any roller coaster ride that anybody has ever seen anywhere in the world. It is a bullet that rightfully deserves the characterization that we critics have given to it, a magic bullet. As uh, articulate and intelligent as Dr. Wecht is, He's wrong. Dr. Michael Bodden worked with Dr. Wecht on the House Assassinations Committee, where Wecht was in the minority. Whenever we try to line up entrance and exits of bullets, there are always a, a million ways in which it couldn't have happened and one way in which it could happen. The president and the governor were moving at the time. They were waving to the crowd at the time that the um, bullet was fired. And there was one millisecond when there was an alignment of the two bodies that permitted this trajectory to happen. But there are conflicting versions of the trajectory, the angles at which the president and Connolly were shot. This Warren Commission exhibit shows the bullet passing through JFK at one angle, while this Secret Service drawing indicates that the bullet that hit Connolly entered at a quite different angle. And critics of the official version, like San Francisco private detective Josiah Thompson, argue that the Sapruder film proves that Kennedy and Connolly were hit by different bullets. For a very short period of time, the President and Connolly and most of the limousine is obscured by a sign between the, that obscured it to Zapruder's camera. So we don't see the impact on Kennedy. What we see are the effects of that impact. And when, when the limousine emerges from behind the sign, we see Kennedy's hands coming up in this fashion with fists closed splayed upward in this position and that happens approximately a, a second any anywhere from a second and a half to three quarters of a second before we see the impact of the bullet on Connolly we see Connolly turn to his right we see his shoulder driven down we see his cheeks puff dramatically, and we see his hair be dislodged. And clearly that had to have been a separate shot. Governor Connolly agreed he was not struck by the same bullet that hit Kennedy. I am convinced beyond any question of a doubt that the first shot that was fired did not hit me. Then I was hit. As persuasive as Governor Connolly is, I can't find anybody at that time who is more persuasive and more honorable in giving testimony as to what happened at the time of the shooting. He was wrong. As far as the which bullet struck him. Government tests of these bullet fragments from Governor Connolly's wrist are used to support the single bullet theory. The tests concluded that it was, quote, highly likely, end quote, that the fragments did match the single bullet, the bullet fired from Oswald's rifle, the bullet that's supposed to have gone through both Kennedy and Connolly. But Dr. Wecht points out that the government's tests were highly selective. Even if they prove to be valid, they are in no way complete. That is a fact of record that they did not test all the fragments. The fragments in the president's body, the fragments in Connolly's chest, and obviously that is a thing that would have to be done because if you're talking about the possibility of more than one bullet, then you have to determine whether or not there are fragments from other bullets. A critical question, just where was the president struck? The Warren Commission drawing showed the wound to be high enough on JFK's body to exit downward through the throat and hit Connolly. But bullet holes in the president's suit coat and shirt seemed to be too low for that. The Warren Commission concluded the president's jacket and shirt must have ridden up his back as he waved to the crowd. But in this shooting reenactment in 1964, FBI agents placed the wound too low to exit through the throat. So did the doctors who drew this autopsy diagram. 
But then they noted in the margin they'd made a mistake and moved the wound higher on JFK's body. It looks like there was a hole in the body and a hole in the clothing that sort of matched that night at Bethesda, and that wound was raised by the time the official autopsy was written that weekend so that that hole could provide the entry point for a downward slanting trajectory which would then come out at the hole at the front of the throat. There is evidence that contrary to the official version, the bullet may not have passed through the president's body at all. Evidence that emerged at the autopsy. 25 years ago, the autopsy room at Bethesda was in the area of this cafeteria. The autopsy, the detailed physical examination of the corpse, is often the most important piece of evidence in a murder. But there are charges that the autopsy performed here on the President of the United States was seriously deficient. Dr. Cyril Wecht says one critical deficiency was an order to the autopsy doctors not to establish the path of the bullets through the body. They were instructed not to do certain things by the FBI people and an admiral and a general who were in the autopsy room that night. They were told, for example, not to trace out the bullet wound in the back, not to trace out the hole through the part of the president's neck. Dr. James Humes performed the autopsy and found a peculiar bullet wound in the president's back. The FBI report on the autopsy said the end of the opening made by the bullet could be felt with the finger and, quote, there was no point of exit and the bullet was not in the body, end quote. Then came a phone call from Parkland Hospital in Dallas. This bullet had been found on a stretcher there. The night of the autopsy, Dr. Humes is observed by the FBI sticking his finger in there and saying that it doesn't go anywhere. It terminates. And therefore, he, and about that time, the phone rings in the autopsy room, and the Secret Service chief is calling one of his agents to the phone and tells him to tell Humes that they've found a bullet on a stretcher. Essentially, the dialogue goes like this. They've got a wound, you've got a wound without a bullet, we've got a bullet without a wound, and so the match is made in the autopsy room, and Humes, provided with this information, says, oh, the pattern is clear. This bullet, which I'm being told about in this telephone call, must have fallen out this hole in the back, which doesn't seem to go anywhere. So at the autopsy, doctors concluded that the bullet that was supposed to have hit both Kennedy and Connolly had not even passed through Kennedy's body. But a few days later, when Dr. Humes handed in his written autopsy report, it stated the bullet had gone through JFK's body, contradicting that report by the FBI. In front of the FBI, Humes said that it, you, you couldn't, it, it terminated. You could feel the end of the hole with his finger. The main difference between Friday night and a few days later when he turns in the autopsy report is that when he turns in the report, he says the bullet passed all the way through the body and exited at the wound at the front of the throat. The most persistent question about the single bullet, known as Warren Commission Exhibit 399, how could it cause seven wounds to JFK and Governor Connolly with so little damage to the bullet? The entire copper jacket of the bullet is intact. The nose, the cone of the bullet, which under the single bullet theory, broke two bones in John Connolly, rib and wrist. That is completely intact, doesn't even show the slightest indentation. That's impossible. The bullet itself is designed to, to go through um, uh, heavy bones very easily. It is a very tough, heavy bullet meant for war purposes, to kill your enemy and to kill anybody who might be next to your, en your enemy, you know, to go through him and go to the next guy. So. Uh, the small amount of deformity is entirely consistent with the, uh, with the bone deformity. Remembering, and maybe people don't understand, when a bullet goes through a body, the only thing that's going to cause it to deform will be striking a bone. If it doesn't strike a bone, it doesn't get deformed. This bullet struck a bone, fired by the FBI into the wrist of a cadaver. And the bullets that broke the wrist of a human cadaver show tremendous mushrooming, peeling back effect that you expect to find when a bullet impacts against dense bone. For years, Wecht has demanded tests to confirm that a bullet like the single bullet can be fired through bone and remain intact. How much would it cost? What kind of an effort would it be for the federal government in this case to get together the rifle and some bullets, to get some goat carcasses, and to get some human cadavers? Shooting a cadaver would be better than shooting the experiments that were done shooting bones, but shooting a living tissue is different than shooting dead tissue. The blood going through the skin, the, the vitality of the skin, affects how the bullet 
is going to deform the underlying bone. So one can never quite reproduce the, the um, um, path of the bullet. You come up with one bullet that will be pristine, like Commission Exhibit 399, the stretcher bullet, that has gone through the wrist of a human cadaver, let alone two bones, like the stretcher bullet must have done under the single bullet scenario, and that will end my criticism. Next, the question of a shot from the grassy knoll. John F. Kennedy caught in a crossfire was more than one person shooting. What does the film taken by Abraham Zapruder actually show? Did the fatal shot to the head come from the rear, from Lee Harvey Oswald's rifle in the Texas School Book Depository? Or was another assassin firing from the front, from the grassy knoll overlooking Dealey Plaza? It seems much more plausible that there was a shot from the rear that caused the head wound. The shot from the front, which was only 50 feet away, struck the president, killed him. President Kennedy was struck by two bullets, and only two bullets, from behind. He was hit with a bullet, fired from the right front from this general area of the grassy knoll stockade fence. The stockade fence. Critics of the Warren Commission have long cited evidence that someone was shooting from behind the fence. Shortly after the shooting, a Dallas patrolman, Joe Marshall Smith, ran up into that area with his gun out. He surprised two men in the bushes, who then showed him Secret Service credentials. No Secret Service agents were in that area. A whole crowd of witnesses ran up the grassy knoll toward the fence, many saying they were certain that a shot had come from there. S.M. Holland was one of several witnesses who saw a puff of smoke near the fence. And one of those shots came from behind that picket fence. And there's no doubt in my mind, I never will be, because I was on the spot. I saw the smoke heard the report, and saw the smoke from behind that fence. There is physical evidence of a shot from the front. Robert Groden, a Warren Commission critic for many years and photo expert for the House Assassinations Committee. At the point of impact on the president, skull, brain were blown to the rear. Motorcycle policeman to the left rear of the president was splattered with such force and such power, he himself thought he had been hit by a bullet. It was that powerful. A piece of the occipital bone was blown 35 feet to the rear and left of the point of impact. It was recovered by Billy Harper, a, a witness. Groden believes Jackie Kennedy climbed onto the trunk of the limousine for a reason that is not generally understood. After the president was hit, she was looking at his head. You can see it in the Zapruder film. She was looking right at him as he was struck. She saw a piece of his head blown to the rear onto the trunk of the car. She turns around, climbs onto the trunk, braces herself with her left hand, reaches out, and pulls in a piece of the president's head that was blown to the rear, brings it back into the car, and attempts to hold it back on, to, to, to fix it, to put it together. In this panic moment, to try to, to try to try to make it all right somehow. Her testi the testimony about what she said was, they've killed my husband, I have his brains in my hand. Dr. Marion Jenkins, one of the doctors who tried to save JFK at Parkland Hospital, encountered Jackie Kennedy in the emergency room. She was, uh, in the first part of it, uh, carrying her hands like this. And on one of her times in, I can't tell you how many times she was in, she nudged me with her elbow and handed me what she had in her hand. It was part of his brain. In her own testimony before the Warren Commission, which was suppressed and not released until the 1972 Freedom of Information Act suit, she says, from the rear, you know, you were trying to hold his hair on and his skull on. She was describing an exit wound in the rear of the president's head. The location of the head wound is key evidence. Since a bullet almost always makes a small wound when it enters and a large wound when it exits, a big wound at the back of JFK's head would indicate a shot from the front and more than one shooter. Most of the doctors and nurses who treated the president at Parkland did see a large wound at the rear of the head. Dr. Robert McClelland. It was 
in the right back part of the head, very large. Nurse Audrey Bell. All, there was a massive wound at the back of his head. Dr. Charles Carrico. There was a, uh, a, a large, uh, quite a large defect about here on his, on his skull. Dr. Ronald Jones. Well, my impression was that, that there was a wound in, in this area of the head, right in, right in this area. Andrew Purdy was counsel to the House Assassinations Committee. He says the Dallas doctors are wrong. When you think of the body as being face up, and you think particularly in Dallas, of the amount of blood that was involved there, people couldn't distinguish where things were. It must have been a terrible, tragic sight. It was very hard for people to recollect exactly where what was when that wasn't their purpose. Their purpose was to save the president's life, and these recollections afterwards are faulty. But six of the Dallas doctors testified they saw a part of the brain called the cerebellum protruding from the president's head wound. The cerebellum is located at the extreme back of the head. And a portion of the cerebellum fell out onto the table as we were doing the, uh, the tracheostomy. It did. Mm -hmm. So the wound was very far back here. Right. The cerebellum was not protruding. We examined the cerebellum uh, by fo fo photographically, and it was intact. That's one of my more vivid memories, I would say, of the whole thing. Was that was particularly uh, grim to see that portion of the brain ooze out of the wound as I sat there looking at it, stood there looking at it. So that stays with you pretty, pretty much. But now, some of the Dallas doctors, like Marion Jenkins, are changing their stories. As late as 1977, Jenkins was saying he had seen the cerebellum protruding from JFK's head wound, meaning the wound was far to the rear. But recently, Jenkins had his first look at the official photos and x-rays. Well, after looking at photo photographs, some made from this angle, looking down at the top of the head. It did look like cerebellum. <laughs> it still looks like it, but it's obviously not. I'm not trying to defend it. I've made an error, and I've been, but I say I make errors. I call my kids the wrong names. Through the years, they never changed their story. Now all of a sudden they're doing it because it's for the public record? I can't buy that. I can't accept that. The Dallas doctor's recollections about an exit wound in the back of the president's head are confirmed by witnesses at the Bethesda Hospital autopsy. I mean, a big gaping hole in the back of the head. Floyd Reby, a photographer on duty, talked with Wayne Friedman. So it's like somebody put a piece of dynamite in a tin can and light it off. There was nothing there. Open area all the way across into the rear of the brain like that. From the top of the head, almost back to the, near the base of the skull. You could see where that part was gone. So eyewitnesses in Dallas and Bethesda describe a wound extending all the way to the back of the head. But official autopsy photos and x-rays move the wound all the way to the front of the head. The photos show the back of the head with hair and scalp intact. No large wound. The x-rays show a large wound extending to the forehead. Certainly I can tell you that the wound was not here, there was no damage to the face uh, that was visible. The wound was where it's evident on the x-rays and the photographs. And the wound was basically in this kind of an area, which is above the forehead. And that's where it was. The autopsy photographs, which I've worked with, which I've seen several times since the late 1970s, absolutely show a totally different set of wounds, especially in the rear of the head. The one in the rear of the head is absolutely nowhere near what any of the doctors described. The point is, people who say President Kennedy was shot from the front say there was a gigantic hole in the back of the president's head. If there was a gigantic hole in the back of the president's head, there must have been a tremendous conspiracy of massive proportions to alter the body, the autopsy photographs, and x-rays to change all that evidence. Our experts say that there was no such conspiracy. But remember the witnesses whose story indicates JFK's body was intercepted between Dallas and Bethesda, switched from one coffin to another, and wrapped differently. We lined the casket with a rubber sheet. I knew a body bag from a bed liner. I'm not sure it was a, it was a body bag. We determined that 
whatever may have happened to the body bag in the coffin, nothing was done to tamper with the body itself, except for what was done by the treating physicians at Parkland Hospital. No skull surgery was done by the Parkland doctors. Yet at Bethesda Hospital, two FBI agents observing the president's autopsy reported, quote, it was apparent that a tracheotomy had been performed, as well as surgery of the head area, namely in the top of the skull. Medical technician O'Connor says when he looked at JFK's body, something was missing. My job was to remove brain, and there was no brain to be removed. It was all gone. The official autopsy report contains a description of the brain O'Connor says wasn't there and says it was preserved in formaldehyde. It is not um, a, a, a matter that can simply be mistaken what? by by the pathologist, whereas I think lots of things can be mistaken by uh, attendants who have no training as, as pathologists. Just because they hang out with pathologists, or because they hang out in the autopsy room, just because they are absolutely certain in their own mind that the brain wasn't present doesn't mean that's valid. In order to remove the brain from the, from the skull, you, you have to cut the top of the skull off and then remove the brain. And that wasn't done. We didn't even touch the skull. We didn't have to. Why not? Well, there's no brain in there to take out. Adding to the mystery, the brain mentioned in official reports is missing from the National Archives after being turned over to Robert Kennedy in 1965. David Lifton argues the president's body was hijacked and altered to hide evidence of the large wound at the back of the head. The key to this whole thing is the autopsy because the autopsy is the diagram of the shooting. It's the body that's the diagram of the shooting. So you either have to have in the autopsy room someone who's willing to lie to the investigators or the body has to lie to the doctors. And I think this is a situation in which the body was made to lie to the doctors. What about the official photos and x-rays? We showed them to the three eyewitnesses to JFK's autopsy. Photos and x-rays not available to the public since the assassination, but recently obtained by the press. Gerald Custer took the x-rays that night. Is this the x-ray picture that you took, and is this the wound that you saw on the president? This area here mm -hmm. was gone. Not this area? Not this area. Floyd Reby assisted with the autopsy photos. The two pictures that I've seen that you showed me that are supposedly from the archives are not what I saw that night. Now, I don't know where those pictures came from. The back of the head looked like that? What did the back uh -huh. of the head look like? It had a big hole in it. This whole area was gone. Does that look like what you saw? No, no, it doesn't look like what I saw. This, this would be... Uh, a lesser of a wound than what I saw. I saw a, a lot worse wound uh, that extended way back into this area here. Was the president's hair and scalp like that? No. What was it like? This part of the head was gone. There was no scalp there. Are you telling me that this is not? I don't believe so. You, you don't think this is an no. honest-to-God no. autopsy photo? No, I don't. What do you think it is? I don't know. It's being phonied someplace. It's make-believe. I'm just a patsy, said Lee Harvey Oswald, for whom judgment came moments later in the basement of a Dallas police station. There is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's the man with a gun. The silencing of Oswald by Jack Ruby leaves only the official version of who killed John Kennedy and how, a version most Americans do not believe. Experts tell us the murder of JFK had the mark of an experienced assassin. Could Oswald have done it alone? No FBI marksman has been able to duplicate the series of shots Oswald is alleged to have fired from the window in the school book depository. Oswald was also charged with the murder of Dallas policeman J.D. Tippett. Some experts believe that if Oswald did kill Tippett, it might have been in self-defense. It's possible that Oswald when confronted with Officer Tippett, 
came to realize that maybe he was about to be killed to be silenced and defended himself and killed Tippett. Purdy suggests that Officer Tippett and Ruby could have been part of a conspiracy. It may be that Jack Ruby and others were involved in a conspiracy to silence Oswald. It may be that Officer Tippett by himself or with others was involved in a conspiracy to silence Oswald also. And that when the attempt to kill Oswald by Officer Tippett failed, then Jack Ruby was a fallback. If Oswald was silenced to prevent him from talking about a conspiracy, or if he was manipulated into the role of fall guy, who was involved? Some experts think that it was renegade members of the CIA. Others think it was the Mafia. And some think that it was elements of the CIA and the mob working together. Oswald had connections to the mob, to Carlos Marcello, the Mafia boss of New Orleans. David Ferry, a close associate of Oswald, worked as an investigator for Marcello. John Davis, author of a new book on Marcello. He controlled all the rackets in Mississippi and uh, he owned the state of Louisiana. He was immensely powerful in Texas. People showed him a great deal of deference. He was the boss. He was the big boss. Marcello was a prime target in Robert Kennedy's all-out drive against the Mafia. Now, according to the information that we have, you are an associate of Mr. Frank Costello, is that right? I decline to answer on the ground of near incoming from the nation. Marcello hated Robert Kennedy, and for a special reason. In 1961, in a move later declared illegal, RFK had Marcello suddenly deported to Guatemala. And Bobby had him literally kidnapped. It took him straight to the airport where this jet was waiting on the runway with its engines going. And before Carlos could even make a telephone call, and he remonstrated that, can I call up my wife? Can I get my toothbrush? Can I get a little cash? No. no. But it was straight on the plane, and they dumped him in Guatemala City. And the Guatemalans then uh, deport him to Salvador, and the Salvadorians uh, deport him to Honduras. Marcelo finally made it back to the U.S., and in 1962, the FBI reported the following remarks by Marcello during a meeting at his house outside New Orleans. Carlos Marcello made the statement that in order to get Bobby Kennedy, they would have to kill the president. They could not kill Bobby because President Kennedy would use the army and Marines to get them. This would result in Bobby losing his powers as attorney general because of the new president. L.A. private detective Ed Becker is the source of the FBI report. He was there when Marcello made the threat. He says, look, you take care of that. When you get a stone in your shoe, it, eventually you have to take it out. He didn't say eventually, but, you know, you, you have to get it out. I says, how are you going to get it out? Are you going to kill him? You know, I'm, I'm big mouth. And he says, no, no. He says, you cut off the head of the snake and the tail dies. That made an impression on me. There is new evidence on the Marcello Oswald connection. In early 1963, a businessman dined alone in the restaurant of this motel in New Orleans. Then after the assassination, he told the FBI he had observed an individual who looked like pictures of Lee Harvey Oswald receive a wad of money under the table from the restaurant owner. The restaurant owner, one Joseph Pareto, is alleged to be number three man in the Carlos Marcello crime family. It would have been easy for Oswald to get on Marcello's payroll. He lived at times in New Orleans with his uncle, Dutz Moret, who was a bookie in the Marcello betting ring. What about Jack Ruby, the man who killed Oswald? Ruby, too, had ties to Carlos Marcello, contacts with the mobsters who ran Marcello's Dallas operations. Ruby also had contacts with top associates of Sam Giancana, boss of the Chicago mob, and Santos Traficante, the mafia chief of Florida two of the gangsters hired by the CIA during the Kennedy presidency to assassinate Fidel Castro. Given the alliance between the Mafia and the CIA to assassinate Fidel Castro, it was perfectly possible that there could have been an alliance between the Mafia and the CIA to assassinate President Kennedy. Since the failed attempt to invade Cuba at the Bay of Pigs in 1961, many CIA agents and anti-Castro Cubans had hated JFK for withholding air support. Former intelligence operative Jerry Hemming says he was offered money to kill JFK. Quite often it would boil down to why are we wasting our time trying to get Castro 
why don't we go to the root of the problem and eliminate the communists in Washington, the number one man, JFK. Although the CIA denied any contact with Lee Harvey Oswald, there are indications Oswald was a low-level agent. One clue, a possible meeting between Oswald and a CIA agent who went by the name Maurice Bishop. Antonio Vesiana, head of a group of anti-Castro commandos, was a witness to the meeting in Dallas two months before the assassination. I saw Lee Harvey Oswald in Dallas uh, in a meeting of 10 or 15 minutes with Mr. Uh, Maurice Bishop. Some experts believe Oswald was using a CIA cover, posing as a left-wing Castro supporter, and that he could have come to the attention of renegade CIA agents. Oswald. Anthony Summers, author of a book on the assassination. The, the reports on Oswald would have presented him as a perfect man um, to set up as a patsy um, in an, an operation to murder the President of the United States. But Judge Bert Griffin, a counsel to the Warren Commission, points out there is no real evidence of conspiracy. The commission never concluded that there was no conspiracy. The commission only said that it, it found no evidence of a conspiracy. And I think if you're talking about evidence, which what lawyers understand to be evidence, I think that's still a sound conclusion. There's nothing that anybody has come up with that would be admissible in a court of law to support a conspiracy prosecution back in 1967, I thought it was possible to come up with a valid reconstruction as to what happened in Dealey Plaza. If I were to try to do the same thing all over again now, 25 years after the assassination, I would recognize honestly that it couldn't be done, that there are so many incoherences in the evidence that there is no plausible way to bring all the evidence together today. Will the questions ever be resolved? With so many witnesses dead or not talking, with the continuing mystery about what really happened to JFK's body, it's hard to see how there will ever be answers that will satisfy the public. So the facts about who killed John Kennedy and why may well remain for the majority of Americans a blank page in our history. I'm Sylvia Chase. Good night.